Good evening, everyone. I want to begin tonight by acknowledging that even though we are gathering in virtual space, each of us is located physically on land that has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples from the beginning. Indigenous peoples who have been the caretakers of this land for thousands of years. Ottawa West Nepean is located in the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. I invite you to take a moment to recognize the first peoples of the land where you live, either by saying it out loud or by typing it into the chat box or Facebook comments. For those of us who are settlers, this recognition of the contributions and historic importance of Indigenous peoples must be clearly connected to our collective commitment to reconciliation and justice in action and not just in words. My name is Amanda Weiss and I am the chair of the Ottawa West Nepean NDP Outreach Committee. On behalf of the committee, I'd like to welcome you to our town hall tonight and thank you for joining us. Governments around the world have mobilized unprecedented public resources to fight the COVID-19 pandemic and prevent economic collapse. These programs must also pay attention to the climate crisis, which poses a similar threat to human safety and prosperity and requires the same kind of social and political mobilization. We can synergize our efforts to simultaneously respond to the pandemic and advance the climate agenda. I'm excited about the panel of great speakers we have tonight on this topic. I have a few technical instructions to start. We are being broadcast simultaneously on Facebook Live this evening. Human safety. So if you are joining us on Zoom, we invite you to turn off your camera if you are concerned about your privacy. We are being broadcast in speaker view, so you should not appear in the Facebook video as long as you remain on mute. For your own enjoyment of the event, you might want to switch your Zoom to speaker view, which you can do in the top right-hand corner of your Zoom window. We'll be hearing from our speakers first, and then we'll have time to pose some questions from you, our participants. If you're joining us on Zoom, you can ask your question at any time by typing it into the chat box. If you're not seeing a chat box, there is a little icon at the bottom of your screen that you can click on, and that will bring up the chat box, usually to the right side of your screen. If you're joining us on Facebook, you can type your question into the comments there at any time during the presentations or during the Q&A. And now I'd like to introduce our moderator, Chandra Pasma, the president of the Ottawa and West Nepean NDP Riding Association. Chandra, over to you. Thanks so much, Amanda, and welcome everyone. So the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change told us two years ago that we had only 12 years left to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And unfortunately, since that time, instead of taking steps to limit climate change, the Ontario government has actually dismantled much of Ontario's climate change policies and programs. Meanwhile, the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed many of the deep, abiding structural inequalities that underpin our society and economy. Low wage workers, racialized communities, newcomers, and people living with disabilities have really borne the brunt of the pandemic. Ironically, the pandemic has helped the fight against climate change by reducing emissions, but it's also shown the enormous cost of doing so if we don't plan to do it in a way that protects people, ensures they still have income security, and provides the public services that they need. We need to have a plan that addresses climate change and social inequality a plan that fights emissions and promotes income security, a plan that protects people and the planet. We're really excited to have a great panel of speakers tonight to help us understand why that's so important and to take a look at what a plan like that would look like for Ontario. Katie Perfett was raised in a working class family in the Ottawa Valley on unceded Algonquin territory. She's a community organizer who first got involved with the climate movement during her time in Halifax. Uh, and since then, she's been involved in anti-fracking and anti-pipeline work across Turtle Island and now supports the participation of young people in the fight to keep fossil fuels in the ground with 350.org. Catherine Abreu is the Executive Director of Climate Action Network Canada, a coalition of more than 100 organizations operating across Canada working on climate change and energy issues. Angela McEwen is the Senior Economist at the Canadian Union of Public Employees and a member of the Steering Committee of the Green Economy Network, 
a coalition of labor, environmental, and social justice organizations working to build a green economy in Canada. And finally, Peter Tobbins is a member of Provincial Parliament for Toronto Danforth and critic on climate change and energy for the Ontario NDP. Before his election to the legislature in 2006, Peter was the executive director for Greenpeace Canada. Peter also served as a climate advisor to former federal NDP leader Jack Layton. So welcome to all of you and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Katie, let's start with you. The Canadian chapter of 350.org is calling for a Green New Deal. Can you tell us more about what a Green New Deal is, what it would look like, and why you believe it's so urgently needed? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Chandra, and thanks for setting this up, Amanda. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to start things off uh, to acknowledge that I'm sure many of you are feeling the tension and stress of the moment that we're in right now, waiting on the results of the U.S. election. Uh, the stakes are really, really high, and yeah, it's uh, it's just a lot right now. So just want to acknowledge that everyone's probably doing double time here on looking at the polls and also listening to this. But I I just want to, I guess, share some of the tea on this in terms of what it means for climate, that regardless of whether Biden or Trump are in office, the next four years are going to be really critical in the fight for the climate. It will just be a matter of how steep is that hill. Um, and I know for a lot of folks with the weight of COVID and all of what it's brought, it can feel really defeating when we're thinking about climate change in the midst of all of these crises that we're facing. Um, you know, violence against black, pe black people, um, you know, COVID ravaging long-term care facilities, plus this like looming threat, it's just a lot. And so it's really easy to feel defeated. And, um, you know, I feel that way a lot. Um, and I feel that our governments are failing us on so many fronts, but there's a really important reason why we need to be very vigilant, especially here in Canada, about our optimism in the fight ahead of us. And the reason I say this is because the overwhelming majority of people in this country believe that climate change is a big problem and don't think our government is doing enough and want to see our government doing more. And that's a really good footing to start from. So, and like, uh, as Chandra said, the UNFCCC told us we need to make these deep emissions reductions. They need to be rapid and far reaching. And really up until uh, that point, we hadn't seen any plans that looked like that. When the UNFCCC told us that, I know a lot of people felt really jarred because it's like, okay, well, what does that even look like? And you know, what does that look like? We weren't even talking about it in a, in a big way in social movements, let alone our politicians weren't talking about it either. So that's why when the Sunrise Movement in the United States um, and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez launched this vision of a Green New Deal into the fore in late 20, 2018, it was kind of this lightning rod moment where I even remember um, messaging a bunch of friends that I had grown up with in the climate movement um, saying like, are you watching this live stream? Can you like believe this? What is the Green New Deal? What does it mean? It sounds like, it sounds like the ticket. It sounds like the kind of plan we need that can give us a shot at a livable future. And uh, this live stream was of course, dozens of young people occupying uh, the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi's office. Um, and AOC coming in and giving this fiery speech. And it was really where the, I think the, the genesis of the version of that movement north of the border uh, began. Um, Our Time, which was a project that I worked on in the lead up to the last federal election, uh, which we endorsed Angela McEwen through, uh, we were able to mobilize thousands of young people towards the election who were really inspired by a Green New Deal we were able to elect a squad of champions, including Matthew Green, who has just been absolutely uh, so powerful as an MP and people like Leah Gazan as well. Um, and it was also the starting point of this coalition of organizations um, that were, you know, on, in their own spheres working towards the Green New Deal and trying to inspire people. And also grassroots people across the country were talking about it too. 
you know, we can't have the carbon copy of what people were envisioning in the U.S. What does it mean for us here in Canada? And people are still doing that organizing today. Um, and what was really cool about this, uh, even though we, f we found out close to the election that still not a lot of people knew what a Green New Deal was, um, is that actually if they, if they were told what the tenets of a Green New Deal was, they believed in it very strongly. Um, Seth Klein, who just came out with a, a book recently uh, about mobilizing oh, like at the wartime scale for the climate emergency, um, he had done some polling with Abacus data or, that said 72% uh, of people polled either strongly or were somewhat supportive of a climate plan that was ambitious, that tackled inequality, that saw mass investments in renewable energy, transforming our economy, creating millions of green jobs, affordable housing construction, the, investing in the caring economy, including education, childcare, and elder care. These were all things that people were like, yeah, I'm on board for that kind of climate plan, even though they didn't know what a Green New Deal was. So we can argue about the name, but at the basic level, people really believe in this kind of a vision. And I think, of course, you know, to round what out what I'm trying to say is that you know, people believe in that kind of vision. And I think the pandemic has really shone a light on all of the really urgent ways we need to address the, the inequalities and the, um, the, you know, the ways that austerity have absolutely undermined our ability to take care of our elders, um, to, you know, have kids in school in a way that is safe. Um, so, yeah, I think for me, what, what happened with the pandemic was really that it reinforced that we do need that really ambitious plan to get us to um, a post-carbon world in a way that's really just. And I'm just going to end with three things that I think in order to get there, there's, there's three things we really need to do. We need to stop uh, our governments from throwing away our public money to the fossil fuel industry. It needs to stop. <laughs> Hundreds of billions of dollars go towards the fossil fuel industry every year. Sorry, my dog's barking. Um, we need to center working people in conversations about climate change. Uh, I think that a lot of the ways that we talk about climate change are from a very policy-centric boardroom kind of uh, you know, ethos. And I also believe that it has to be rooted for justice for Indigenous people and, and Black folks and people of color. Um, you know, the fact that our governments take Indigenous children to court instead of fixing a boiled water crisis on First Nations reserves, uh, that they spend $2 billion, or sorry, they're, they're potentially going to spend $20 billion on a pipeline and not fix the fact that Indigenous communities can't turn on their taps and have clean water, that's criminal. And so those for me are, we can't move ahead with a Green New Deal or any kind of climate plan unless it's rooted in those three things. I'm going to edit off there. I'm so excited to hear Kat, um, you know, talk about the, how we moved from Green New Deal to talking about a just recovery and how it's all interconnected. I'm just so excited about this conversation. So thank you. Thanks so much, Katie. Um, listening to you, I'm reminded of the quote that someone said once about how it takes a true revolutionary to make hope possible rather than despair inevitable. So thanks for making us all feel hopeful tonight. And that was a perfect segue to Kat. So Kat, the Climate Action Network has joined hundreds of other organizations earlier this year, launching a set of principles that you say are necessary for a just recovery. Can you tell us more about those principles and what they include? Yeah, sure thing. Um, and hi, everyone. Really pleased to be with you today. I'm joining from Mi'kmaq, um, the traditional lands of uh, Mi'kmaq people on the east coast of Canada and what is also known as Nova Scotia, um, and feeling really privileged to be able to be back here. Um, although I am normally based in Algonquin Anishinaabe territory in Ottawa. Um, so yeah, thanks, Katie. Always such a pleasure to join you and also you, Angela, in these um, speaking engagements, some brilliant um, femme heroes of mine. So 
I am going to talk to you a little bit today about the Just Recovery Movement, which is something that uh, I and Climate Action Network Canada have been really honored um, to be a part of in the last number of months. Uh, so Katie walked us through the kind of theory behind the Green New Deal. And I think a big part of um, what Katie articulated and what I really feel in the work that we've done to engage on the Green New Deal in the last number of years is that it is really about be putting people at the heart of, of climate action, right? So it's about saying like, Taking action on climate change is not about a series of technological fixes. It's not about figuring out how to transition um, an economy that's based on never ending exponential growth uh, from one that consumes fossil fuels to one that consumes renewable energy. It's about fundamentally changing at a structural level um, the economic and social systems that we use to engage with one another and to to build a, a more just society, um, and in in the same time, at the same time, you know, dramatically reduce carbon emissions and deal with a lot of other environmental crises that we're faced with. Um, and the heart of that is is really about resilience, right? It's like this word that I think we've been hearing a lot over the course of the pandemic, and um, one that I haven't yet grown tired of because I think that the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed um, the incredible vulnerability and volatility that all of us um, are faced with in the given the current injustices baked into the economic and social systems that we that we function in right now. Um, so the Just Recovery Movement, it really came out of this acknowledgement that there are a series of ongoing crises that really lurk behind the health and economic emergencies that we are faced with during this pandemic. And those crises are things like inequality in income, wealth and access to essential services, um, racial and other forms of discrimination, colonial structures that perpetuate harmful resource and cultural extraction, and of course, the externalization of environmental harm. And of course, that externalization of environmental harm is what underpins climate chaos and ecological collapse. So we've been confronted with these vulnerabilities during the COVID-19 pandemic. And yet we've also in this moment been reminded of the incredible richness and resourcefulness that we have at our disposal to address these crises and to build resilience. Um, so we know that material wealth can be distributed more equitably. And we know that that material wealth is available to us, right? So a big thing that we've learned in this crisis is like this myth that, we, that, that, that we've been you know, convinced of over the course of the last three to four decades that there's just not enough to go around is a lie. You know, and, and that myth, that, that myth of scarcity is so much at the heart of a lot of the political tensions that we have been faced with over the course of the last number of decades. There's not enough money for us to confront climate change. There's not enough money for us to welcome new Canadians into our country. There's not enough to go around. We can't share, we can't fix these problems. We all have to protect ourselves and our interests, right? And that, myth of scarcity, who does it benefit? It benefits those who are already hoarding wealth and making billions off of um, the kind of fear and, and division that that, scare, that fear, um, that that myth of scarcity really sows in the, in, amongst many people. Um, and that combines with the kinds of anxiety that I think a lot of us are grappling with in, uh, in a, an economic system that really doesn't work for people or the planet. <clears throat> um, we, we can see that um, there's durability in natural ecosystems that can adapt or bounce back when given a chance. So, you know, throughout this crisis, so many of us have just been longing for our moments of connecting with the outside world, getting out for our daily walks, re reconnecting with gardening, um, being delighted by the reemergence of species in parts of urban environments where we haven't seen them for so long, delighting in cleaner air. You know, I think this has given us some insight into the kind of world we might be able to inhabit if we created different systems that allowed us to live in better harmony with the non-human world. Um, 
And we've also seen this myth dispelled that in times of crisis, we divide amongst ourselves because time and time again, we have seen that crisis actually brings us together. And this um, coming together, this like spirit of mutual care of communion has transformed so many of our experiences of this pandemic. And the Just Recovery Movement is really about trying to take this caring that has transformed so many of our personal experiences and um, making it something that transforms our societies as we build back from the pandemic. So the Just Recovery Movement is a hugely diverse one um, and one that is, you know, uh, a loose coalition. It's not about um, organizations coming together and uh, and being really directive. It's about organizations coming together and finding a home for the huge diversity of recommendations that are being made right now um, for the kinds of transformative progressive changes that can be made to our economic and social systems so that we build that more, more just society together and so that we bring the spirit of mutual care um, into what comes before us or that what comes next, I should say. Um, so there are six principles that we have signed on to. This, these six principles were inspired by five principles for a just recovery that were released at the international scale and signed on to by a number of international organizations. Um, but many of the organizations in Canada felt that we could bring those, those international principles here, customize them um, for to be meaningful within the context of this country. And, uh, and so we spent six weeks co-authoring these principles together we released them on May 25th, 2020, um, and now five, over 550 organizations really from every corner of progressive civil society in Canada have signed on to them. Um, I will encourage you to go to justrecoveryforall.ca to take a look at those principles and read them in more detail. I'm just going to give you the titles of them so you have an idea of the kind of the highlights. Uh, and I'll also say that these principles are purposefully high level because they are meant to you know, kind of create this umbrella where the more detailed recommendations that are being developed at the organizational level can come through. Um, so those principles are number one, put people's health and well-being first, no exceptions. Two, strengthen the social safety net and provide relief directly to people. Three, prioritize the needs of workers and communities. Four, build resilience to prevent future crises. Five, build solidarity and equity across communities, generations, and borders. And six, uphold Indigenous rights and work in partnership with Indigenous peoples. Um, so these principles have now sparked uh, an incredible amount of work across the country. And I see the ways in which they're so aligned with the work for a Green New Deal in Canada. In fact, many of the same organizations are involved in both campaigns. And I think the Just Recovery for All movement has helped to build these bridges between organizations and sectors of the progressive civil society in Canada that have previously been really quite siloed. Um, so in this spirit of kind of collaboration and coming together, um, I think there have been a, an incredible amount of questions being asked, a lot of really incredible work being done. And it's inspired me. It's been a once in a career, once in a lifetime opportunity to engage in this work. And I feel really um, touched to have been a part of it and to see where it goes in the future. Um, I will say a couple of things and then I'll, I'll close my comments. May 25th was the day that George Floyd was killed in the United States. Um, and we really quickly realized that the release of the just recovery principles that, you know, we hadn't gotten everything right. We hadn't explicitly named white supremacy and anti-Black racism in the principles. Um, we also didn't explicitly call the principles or spell out the fact that the principles are feminist principles. Um, so, it's, it's also been a real learning opportunity to realize that, you know, you don't always get everything right the first time around, even when you, you would try really hard. Um, and I think that's actually a big part of what we need to be doing right now is getting into those spaces where we are growing, um, we are confronting the fact that we don't have to get things right all the time, and we're leaving ourselves flexibility to kind of learn from some of those mistakes. Um, and do better next time. And that's kind of where we're at in this moment. Uh, and so, yeah, really looking forward to hearing what Angela has to say. Thanks so much again for having me. Um, and I'll hand it off. 
Thanks so much, Kat. I love that idea of an ethic of care underpinning the principles. Uh, so Angela, over the past seven months, we've seen the devastation that occurs when thousands of people are out of work, but we've also seen that the burden of that unemployment and income security falls most heavily on people who are already vulnerable and socially disadvantaged. Uh, so it's people who are racialized, people who are newcomers, people who have disabilities, uh, people who have been living at low income. And we know that these same people are the ones who are most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change too. So how do we build a recovery plan that provides income security and protects workers and halts climate change? Thanks, Chandra. It's a, it's a huge ask for sure. Um, and I think that uh, that's one of the reasons why a Green New Deal or the Just Recovery really resonates with workers. So if you just talk about a just transition as unions used to do, they were thinking only about transitioning, say, uh, welders from jobs building pipelines to welders doing something else. And that of course leaves out a whole bunch of workers. If you think about who are the workers in the oil sands, there were truck drivers, um, there are city workers, there's hospitals, all of that goes away actually when um, when you're trying to transition your economy it, when you're talking about something like Fort McMurray, right? Where half of the jobs are directly in oil and gas. And so um, we, can, we can still talk about retraining workers and thinking about what the path is for um, how do we use steel if we're not using the steel to build pipelines? What else could we build? Can we build um, renewable energy? Can we build um, transit, like buses and trains and, and things like that in Canada uh, to replace those jobs? But that's not gonna help kind of all of the, the collateral damage, right? When you have a town shut down and nurses are laid off and teachers are laid off um, and, and have to relocate and sell their houses that are now worth nothing. And, and where did they move to? They have to up, up uproot their whole community. And there are um, always going to be, always, this is what we've seen in this, this pandemic, is that it's always, the, as you said, the already precarious um, workers who uh, have the fewest supports um, already that are affected the worst. So if your immigration status is questionable, then you don't know if you're gonna get the income supports that other people get. You don't know if you're gonna be able to stay uh, and work, you have a harder time fighting for your rights at work. And so in order to have a green and just recovery, we need strong labor legislation. We need strong minimum wages. We need the same rates for migrant workers. We need um, to have actual inspections of long-term care homes to make sure that they're meeting their, their thing. But we also need to think about what, what should be publicly delivered. What's the role of government in taking care of each other. And so long-term care should be public. That's kind of part of this whole ethic of care. How do we, how are we organizing our society in a way where we take care of each other and where we um, meet our responsibilities to each other? Because right now we're not meeting our responsibilities to each other in so many different ways. And that comes out in um, migrant workers in long-term care and in food processing that are, that were getting sick and, and some died because they didn't have access to the same protections, the labor protections, and they were exploited by their employers. And that's absolutely um, inexcusable in our, in our society that that would be happening. There's no reason for it. Um, and it's part of the whole fabric of how we got into the situation that we're in right now, where um, capital exploits labor. <laughs> Right, so we're, and if, so if you have a, a, a green recovery where capital gets to set the terms and says, oh no, this is all about financialization and we just need everybody to be able to, you know, borrow enough money to refit their houses, then that will create jobs and we'll all be fine. Um, there's the famous um, saying by, by Audre Lorde, you know, you can't uh, tear down the master's house with the tools that built it. And so we can't, create a world based on care using tools like financialization and, and loans. It has to be centered at people. It can't be centered on the market. 
And, uh, and that means having honest conversations with workers because in some places it is workers and labor unions like we've seen this in BC and Alberta that are pushing back against climate action. Um, and, and that's because people, I think, it's partly because people aren't having honest conversations. Um, and so they don't believe, they know that somebody is still getting rich, right? And they want to be in on it. And they, they think it's only fair. Uh, and so to cut them out is not fair. And, but when you have an honest conversation with workers and the Alberta Federation of Labor did this with a whole bunch of workers, when you have that honest conversation with workers and you say like, look, we don't have any more time. We can't keep doing this. We're killing our, our, our futures here. They, um, they understand and they become part of the solution. Um, and you say like, look, it's not about transitioning early. It's this industry is no longer viable, um, but your community still is. And so it becomes dangerous when, um, when you uh, equate being pro-climate change with your identity uh, in other ways or anti-climate change with your identity in other ways. And so when we're talking about climate change, when we're talking about what's happening in our communities. Um, I think it's just really important. So I grew up in a small rural area. My family doesn't all believe that climate change is real. And if it is, they think maybe it'll help them. Um, so I just, I think, on, and they think that we think they're stupid um, and that we're calling them dirty and that we're calling them bad. And so it's really important, uh, I think, to really situate where people are and they're not fighting for uh, a dead planet, they're fighting for their communities. And they think that they're doing the best thing that they can do for their families. And so having a conversation that removes it from that, um, that identity, that core of their identity and into, we're all in this together, we all care about our community, we all have these same values. When you're talking about the, the values of family, the values of, of a better future, for their kids that resonates more and that gets workers on board because workers absolutely have to be part of this conversation and i think that that katie and catherine and other groups that have been engaged in this to seth klein have been engaged in this discussion around a just recovery have really done a lot of work to make sure that that has happened and so i really applaud you guys <laughs> thank you Thanks, Angela. And maybe one thing I'll add, since both of us work for the Canadian Union of Public Employees, and QP has lots of locals that are actually bargaining uh, measures to uh, reduce emissions or to become more green and at their workplace, that when you don't make it a question of your job versus action on climate change, that workers can actually be at the forefront of leading this change and pressing employers to take the necessary steps. And that's another reason why it's really important that we include workers in this conversation. Um, Peter, the Ontario NDP are calling for a Green New Democratic deal. Can you tell us more about what that would look like and how it would address the environmental and social and economic aspects of recovery in Ontario? Sandra, I'd be very happy to. And I, I wanna thank you for inviting me this evening. And I wanna thank the panelists who've already spoken this is, there's a lot of good stuff happening here this evening. Uh, as you had said right at the beginning, Sandra, the Ford government has dismantled uh, the half a loaf of environmental and climate action measures that have been put in place before they were elected. And so we're in a position um, knowing that two years ago, we were told we had 12 months to take on, 12 years to take on uh, the worst of the climate crisis. And we've lost two and we're gonna lose another two as long as this government is in power. Uh, about a year and a half ago, the Ontario NDP decided to put together a climate plan. And we were profoundly affected by the thinking that had arisen around the Green New Deal, uh, because for us, it allowed us to address the technical question of how you move away from a fossil fuel based economy uh, to one that was based on green energy and sustainable principles, while addressing the big equity issues at the same time. 
it, it was a really a perfect fit for our caucus and people were very enthusiastic about it. Uh, we didn't plan in June of 2019 to use this as a tool for dealing with a just recovery, uh, but COVID has imposed itself on us. And frankly, it's very clear from the kind of impact a Green New Democratic deal would have uh, that it would be extraordinarily powerful in coming to grips with the economic fallout from the COVID, COVID experience. I should just say that uh, we've also been putting forward a series of private members bills outlining a number of policy areas that we think are gonna be important to actually make that transition. For instance, uh, we brought forward a bill to ban fracking uh, a bill to allow for a legal framework to go after oil and gas companies to claim against them for climate damages, uh, a bill to reshape the medical system in Canada so we can deal with a hotter world because we will have some very different health issues coming at us, and obviously a public sector climate strategy because we think there's a, the potential to accelerate, to speed up the whole process by dealing with those things that we already own. We don't have to negotiate with the private sector. Uh, we can invest in making buildings net zero right now because it's to our advantage. So uh, we know that we have to come up with a plan that makes sense to people electorally uh, and that is actually doable. And that's imposed a fair amount of discipline on us in the way that we've approached the issue. Uh, and it's clear, again, from the previous panelists who were speaking, that if we're going to be successful, we have to break the old pattern of not involving Indigenous peoples, racialized peoples, women, keep, and many other uh, equity-seeking groups. Keeping them out of the planning process in the past doesn't work. Uh, it will stymie the kind of development that we need. And we have an opportunity actually, as we substantially improve our economy and to go to Angela's comments, uh, expand the size of the public sector to address a lot of these equity issues in a way that hasn't been possible before. Now, let's be very clear, the fight against the oil and gas companies is gonna be very messy and very difficult. Uh, they are quite powerful. They have the ability to make and break governments. They have the ability to shape the media environment that we operate in, and they don't hesitate to use that power. Uh, so for us, the goals of incorporating equity advance with advance on the climate crisis is not only good because it reflects our principles, but it's also critical in terms of winning that big battle. Uh, because if we don't bring on board the labor movement, women's movement, uh, the movements of racialized people, the indigenous community, um, we won't be able to win elections. Uh, the other side is well resourced and they will make sure that their, their parties and their surrogates are able to fight quite vigorously with adequate resources. But the other part of all this is that uh, winning elections, although it's critical, is not enough. And I speak from having watched this both inside and outside government, the pressure, the pushback to not implement these kinds of policies will be immense. And having built an electoral coalition to win government power to implement this, maintaining that coalition so that one can actually resist the pushback is going to be critical. Uh, I think a lot of people think you win an election, you declare what you're going to do when it goes on. No, it is a, an ongoing conflict and struggle. I, I fought the tobacco industry in the 90s. Believe me, your opponents do not give up when there are billions of dollars on the table. Uh, I'm somewhat constrained because although we've done an awful lot of work on our Green New Democratic deal, we haven't made the whole thing public yet. Uh, I can talk about the things that have been made public. and. Um, just allude to those others in the latter part of my commentary. Uh, the, the goals that we set, 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions in Ontario by 2030, and, and sorry, 50% reduction compared to 2005 levels for 2030 and net zero by 2050. And we consider those the minimum targets for a credible plan to tackle the climate crisis. 
one of the things that I don't think is often talked about is the extraordinary opportunity in terms of work and uh, wealth generation from making this transition. Uh, Ontario spends about 14 to $20 billion a year on importing fossil fuels. When we replace that with energy efficiency and renewable power within Ontario, we bring literally tens of billions of dollars back into our economy to employ people and to fund the kinds of social services that we need and that people need to feel they will get to motivate them to back this kind of plan. We, we also recognize, and I alluded to that at the beginning, when you're engaged in a very large scale program of making this transition, uh, you're in a position to deal with the economic crisis that the pandemic has created. And we, I'll just talk about one of the major aspects of our plan that we have made public and that's the building retrofit program. It was quite astounding to me. Uh, first of all, we, we realized to we'll actually make the goal of uh, 50% reduction by 2030, uh, you would have to engage in the world's biggest retrofit program, which is not a bad thing. It's actually a great thing because the opportunity is there to put to work tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people, not only directly in skilled trades, doing electrical, carpentry, uh, plumbing work, which is great for those who are in the trades, but there's a whole range of ancillary work in terms of design, administration, uh, child care for the workers who are working. Uh, you can just see how the economy grows substantially when you stop sending $20 billion out of the province every year and keep it in the province to invest in the people who live here. Uh, so for us, that, that was quite a revelation. In fact, uh, and Angela, if you do this work at labor economics, um, just on this one project, we thought we could create a labor shortage here. Um, and I will just say, historically speaking, working people do really well when there's a labor shortage. Uh, this is not something to fear. It's something to say, yeah, yeah, we deserve higher wages. We're high value. Pay us. We'll do the work. Uh, we realized that fully ramped up, we would be retrofitting about 5% of the houses in Ontario every year. That's uh, something like 200,000 houses. So we're talking about an industry that's comparable in scale to the new house building industry that already exists. Um, there are three areas where we obviously want to channel this work. One is in the public sector, we have the opportunity because we own the buildings already or we finance them already to be very aggressive and making sure that the building stock in the public sector by 2030 is net zero. Uh, we're also in a position to say that all new public sector financed or owned buildings uh, would be net zero buildings so that we don't have to go back and retrofit them. We've actually brought them to the standards. Uh, and at the same time, because we're doing that in the public sector, we're learning a lot about how you do mass retrofit uh, and we're generating the suppliers who can allow us to, what can I say, provide all those goods and all those innovations that we can sell in other places. We think that that approach on its own uh, would have substantial economic benefits and social benefits. Uh, but as you are well aware, and everyone who's part of this call will be well aware, uh, we have to do a lot more than that. We have to look at developing transit systems, uh, we have to move fossil fuels out of the electricity sector. Uh, in terms of carbon pricing, our current position is cap and trade seems to be the best fit. Um, and that may be another debate, but that's what we've incorporated. And looking at carbon sequestration, afforestation, and working with uh, farmers and their soils to deal with those emissions that technologically we can't get at at the moment. So we're still working on this. COVID really knocked us off track. There are a number of other things that became more urgent to deal with, uh, but we do expect uh, in the new year to bring our full plan out. And if you wanna have another session with you and your, your team, I'm very happy to come back. So I'll just wrap up by saying, 
we've got multiple crises. If you've got a program that addresses equity issues, addresses the climate crisis, the economic crisis that comes out of the pandemic, then that's the kind of program we need. And with that, I'll wrap up. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Peter. Uh, that was a great peek at the Green New Democratic Deal, and I can't wait to see the whole thing. Uh, we're going to turn now to questions from our audience. So I just want to remind people that you can submit a question either by putting it into the chat box on Zoom or typing it into the uh, comments on Facebook. And to kick us off, I'm going to start with one of the questions that was submitted in advance from Calvin in Ottawa. Uh, and this is a question for Peter. So recently, we've seen NDP governments in BC and Alberta supporting pipelines and fossil fuel development. So what do you say to those who are worried that the NDP might not be committed to taking meaningful change once they're actually in government? Well, I, I'm not going to speak to the thinking that's gone on in those other jurisdictions, but I'll talk about what the reality is in Ontario. Uh, we are importers of fossil fuels. Uh, it is to our advantage profoundly to stop becoming importers, to utilize our own labor and products to displace all of the fossil fuels that we're now spending a fortune on. And I would say that for us, uh, the, the equation is very simple. We don't have to displace uh, a large oil and gas sector in Ontario. What we do need to do, however, is employ an awful lot of people replacing those imported products. Thanks, Peter. Uh, this is a question from Kathleen in Ottawa for, um, Katie and uh, Kat, do you think that we need a Climate Accountability Act? And if so, what would that look like? Um, thanks, Kathy. I'm going to hop in because uh, uh, climate accountability has been one of our core campaigns at Climate Action Network Canada for many years now. So um, when we talk about Canadian climate accountability, basically the way I like to say this is like, if you are in the dating world and time and time again, you keep choosing the wrong partner, eventually you have to ask if there's something about you that needs to change. Canada has been um, setting climate targets since the early 1990s. We have not met a single one. Uh, at some point we have to ask ourselves, is there something about the way we actually take action on climate in this country that needs to change? And um, the answer clearly is yes. Not only does the level of ambition that we take to those climate targets needs to change really dramatically, we at Climate Action Network Canada think that the current level of ambition of the federal government, government when it comes to emissions reductions needs to at least double. So right now we have a commitment under the Paris Agreement to reduce emissions 30% below 2005 levels by um, 2030. Climate Action Network Canada says our domestic emissions reductions have to go to at least 60% below 2005 levels by 2030. And at the same time, we need to dramatically scale up the support that we are delivering internationally to help other countries and other parts of the world reduce emissions and adapt to the impacts of climate change. And um, so we need to increase, increase that ambition, but we also need to make a series of legislative and institutional changes um, that make sure that current and future governments are held accountable to our climate commitments so that we never miss another target. Um, you can take a look on our website. If you just search accountability on our website, you'll find a blog that contains uh, all of the pieces that we've done on accountability in the last number of years. We recently released a, port, a report that outlines the five pillars of Canadian climate accountability. Um, and those pillars look like setting and legislating long-term targets. So that's legislating net zero by 2050 in law, legislating an improved 2030 target, legislating five-year interim milestones. So you're actually breaking down those long-term targets into smaller increments that make sense to people. Then you actually establish and you codify a timeline according to which you, you set those five-year milestones, you establish the plans to meet them, you establish your carbon budgets, you report on your progress toward those plans, you course correct over time, you ramp ambition up over time in line with our commitments under the Paris Agreement. You not only do that on the mitigation side, but you do that on the adaptation side. So not only do we need to set those emissions reduction goals and deliver plans to meet them, but we also need to figure out 
what kinds of impacts climate change are going to be having in Canada and establish plans on a regular time timeline to adapt to those impacts. We need to be establishing a third party body that provides the kind of expertise and advice um, that we need to be delivering those science based targets to be tracking our progress over time, course correcting when things aren't making sense. And that body should also help in really dramatically changing the way Canadian governments communicate with Canadians about climate action. We've really seen in the last year what it looks like for a government to behave as though there's emergency. We need to be seeing the same thing on the climate crisis. We are in an emergency. We need to be hearing from our governments, not just once a year, when some model tells us how near or far away we are from a goal that's 15 years away. We need to be hearing them from them like every month. Tell us how climate action is changing our community. Tell us how we can participate in it. Um, and finally, we need to be institutionalizing the conversation about effort sharing in Canada, i.e. how do the provinces, territories, federal government, indigenous governments all share the responsibility for taking action on climate, on climate change in Canada? Um, and how does that happen in a way that is not just about political football um, game playing um, and is actually about getting the job done? So yeah, we're really hoping that these are the pieces that are contained in climate legislation that we've been promised um, by the current government. And it's not, yeah, so it's not just about putting a long-term target in law, it's actually about putting these accountability measures in place. Yeah, and I might just chime in to say, I don't have anything to add on, on do we need one, but I just wanted to also tell a story of um, back in 2009 when um, it was Jack Layton who uh, actually introduced uh, Bill C-377 in the House of Commons um, and that piece of legislation uh, over time ended up being kind of buried by uh, Stephen Harper when he was in power. And I was a wee um, baby undergrad student in Ottawa. My friend dragged me to this. Uh, it was the first power shift conference that happened in Canada. I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Deb, if Deb can mute themselves, that would be great. I can't hear myself. <laughs> there we go. Um, yeah, so, so I was a little baby organizer, not really even an activist yet, but I went to this power shift conference. And then after the conference, um, a friend and I went to listen in on the House of Commons because they were talking about this Climate Change Accountability Act. And that during that time, uh, there actually was really intense activism that happened in the gallery in the House of Commons. It was young people standing up and, uh, you know, yelling shame at Stephen Harper's government for not taking this really important piece of legislation seriously. Um, it ended with, uh, you know, dozens of young people getting dragged out of Parliament. And it was a really formative moment for, for me as an organizer in terms of um, you know, it wasn't until years later that I actually like formed this, um, formed this understanding of how important it is for social movements and political parties to be like really working in lockstep with one another. Um, and I think, you know, over the years, the NDP has, has done that well. There are times when the NDP has, um, you know, pulled, pulled back from social movements, but I think the times when the NDP like galvanizes the base that, um, uh, really grows the party in important ways and energizes the people in their communities is when they are working in, with social movements. So I just, yeah, this talk about Climate Change Accountability Act, every time that conversation come, comes up, I think about that time in 2009 when uh, it, it, you know, the stakes were really high then and they're still really high now. And so just want to see more of that, um, you know, working together of social movements and, um, and political activists. Thanks so much, Katie. Uh, Angela, here's a question for you from Carolyn. What elements of a new deal, a green new deal, would be most of uh, most concern in Ottawa West Nepean? Sure. So if we um, help low-income uh, housing 
renovate their houses so that they are using less energy, um, that, that helps them save money. So um, that's one really big aspect. I think it's really important um, to focus on making public buildings um, zero emission because that's something that's under your control as a government. It makes sense to be doing that and that puts workers to work and that, that lowers your costs. But the other really important thing I think is helping address um, the emissions in, in, in low income housing and, and rental housing. And we just have to make sure that it's not something where, again, the landlord gets the money and then rent evicts people, right? So again, you have to be really thoughtful about how you design and implement these policies, but that's really big. And then that also creates jobs, right? And then the other piece in Ottawa West Opinion is transit. If we had free public transit, uh, in Ottawa, if we had a public system, we had now the LRT system that's a P3, and it's been an absolute disaster. I don't know if all of you live in Ottawa, but like the tiles are slippery and the wheels aren't round and nothing's been delivered on time. And that's because that, I mean, that's endemic to P3 um, delivery. If it were public, if we made it free, if we make transit so that it makes sense for people, uh, in their lives, then they'll use it more and there will be fewer emissions. And so those are two of the platforms actually of the, the green economy network. That's how you create jobs and lower emissions and um, actually help address inequality at the same time. Thanks, Angela. This question is for Peter from Jeff. How do we support the transition to renewable forms of energy in Ontario? Peter, the famous words of 2020, you're still on mute. I know, they're so film famous. And you would think that we would have adjusted or I would have adjusted by now. Um, what you need is a government that's committed to renewable power and public power. I don't think you can do it with the Liberals and I don't think you can do it with the Tories. Uh, the Liberals brought in their, their green energy program and backed off uh, dramatically long before the Tories were elected. Uh, we've made it as part of our platform to invest in efficiency and then renewables and then buying power from Quebec in that order to deal with power needs. And if you're gonna have a society that takes advantage of displacing the cost of, fo of fossil fuels, uh, then you need a government that's committed to that shift. Thanks, Peter. Um, so I can't believe I'm saying this already, but this hour has already flown by. This is our final question of the night. So you've all been very clear that um, there's still a long road ahead of us, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done to build a green uh, and just recovery for Ontario and for Canada, and uh, to build a better society and economy and protect our planet. But having said that, what's one action that you recommend that everyone take tomorrow uh, to take steps towards that green and just recovery. Uh, Peter, we'll start with you. Um, I'm glad you asked me the question. I recommend people get involved in the NDP and within the NDP push for the kind of green plan that I've been discussing. Here, here. <laughs> Angela? So, um... Katie and, and Peter both touched on this, the importance of social movements in pushing for change outside of government. Um, and so you not only have to elect people that you think will be accountable, like Peter, you have to create a movement outside of government that will allow them to push back against other entrenched interests. And so we're talking about huge amounts of money. We're talking about hugely powerful entrenched interests. We need the power of people to stand up, um, to be clear, to have those conversations with your neighbors and friends, um, and not necessarily in a partisan way, because uh, there's lots of ways to do it that aren't partisan. You can do it through like the Climate Action Network is not partisan. The uh, 350.org, they, um, they actually endorse climate activists from multiple parties. And so you can do this work at the local level, get involved in your community and create that power that people have. We have this power. They keep trying to convince us that we don't, but we do, and we just have to use it in order to support those people like Peter that we hopefully elect. Thanks, Angela. Kat? 
Yeah, like what Angela said. <laughs> I mean, I think really like, you know, the, the, my three point plan is like, talk to your friends, your neighbors, your loved ones about climate change. When you talk to people about climate change, you open the door for them to care about climate change and talk to other people about it. Talk to your elected official, regardless of political party, climate change is a nonpartisan issue. And if you can use energy less and better, but the, the real key is the structural change. It's not about the individual change. So um, that's why the first two come first. Thanks, Kat and Katie. Oh, everything that everyone's already said. Um, but I will also invite folks um, on November 17th is the uh, annual general meeting for the Trans Mountain Pipeline, which is now a Crown Corporation. And on that morning, uh, communities across the country are going to be waking their politicians up uh, to the climate crisis and to the fact that our government, our federal government could be spending billions of dollars on this pipeline. Um, so invite people to join those events. And I also invite folks to um, tweet at Jagmate Singh and let him know that uh, it's really important that the NDP use their position to uh, pressure, put pressure on our federal government and, and show what is the right position on, on this issue. We also know that Keystone could be, is coming up again. And so uh, where the NDP can really, um, you know, yeah, really stand up to these mega projects that um, our, our governments are still pushing uh, at all levels, uh, that's really important for for leaders to do. So if you can tweet at Jagmeet Singh, that would be really great, but um, also join us on the 17th. That would be wonderful. Thanks so much, Katie. And thank you so much to all of our amazing panelists for sharing your time, your experience, and your wisdom with us tonight. We really appreciate it. And thank you to all of you who took the time to join us on Zoom and on Facebook and for asking such insightful questions. As Peter mentioned, uh, we need to show that there's significant support for a Green New Deal in Ontario. And you can sign the Ontario NDP's page in support of a Green New Deal. We've put that link in the chat and in the Facebook comments, but it's www.ontarioNDP.ca slash Green New Deal. You can also sign up for the Ottawa West Nepean NDP newsletter to learn about more events like this that we're holding, or make a donation to support our work by going to the website, which is at owndp.ca. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, everyone, and have a good night.